Thanks for co coming to this uh, uh, press conference. Uh, today is uh, May Day. Let me take this opportunity to wish all our workers a healthy May Day, particularly our healthcare workers. Despite the holiday, many of them, in fact, most of them, are still working in our healthcare institutions to take care of our patients. I want to thank them for their dedication and their commitment. We are about four weeks into the circuit breaker. The, many of the measures we put in place have shown some progress. The number of new cases in the community has uh, come down. However, the number of new infections at our dormitories remain a challenge. So today, we would like to focus on our foreign workers and what we are doing to take care of them. First, uh, let me ask DMS to give us a quick update on the medical side. Then Minister Josephine Teo will talk about our strategy on our migrant workers. Let me just say a few words in Mandarin. Today is our migrant workers. I am here to wish all our workers a healthy and safe migrant day, especially our medical workers. 啊，祝我们的医疗人员呢，也能够有一个健康的一个呃劳动节。我们许多的劳呃医疗服务的劳动队伍，今天虽然是公共假期，他们还在我们的医疗单位里面啊，辛勤的工作，照顾我们的病人。在这里，我仅啊代表所所有的新加坡人啊，向他们呃呃，恭祝他们有健康的劳动节，也谢谢他们的努力和他们的献身的精神。接着下来，我要邀请我们的医药医药总监，呃呃 ，Professor Kenneth Mark 为我们讲解一下今天的呃医药情况的一个简报。Thank you very much, Minister. As of the first of May, 2020, 12 p.m., the Ministry of Health has preliminarily confirmed an additional 932 cases of COVID-19 infection in Singapore. The vast majority of these cases are in work permit holders who are residing in foreign worker dormitories. Uh, in the island. Five of these cases are Singaporeans or permanent residents of Singapore. We are still working through the rest of the details of the cases and a further update will be provided through the uh, MOH press release that will be issued later tonight. Josephine? Today is May Day. Uh, we'd like to thank all the workers who in various sectors have made adjustments to the circuit breaker measures. Um, in particular, we also want to thank the migrant workers, particularly those who are living in the dormitories. Many more precautions have been implemented to safeguard their health, and they have been cooperative. They understand the necessity of these precautions, and we very much appreciate them working together with the officers on the ground to ensure that these measures are properly adhered to. Um, we are taking a comprehensive approach to manage the COVID-19 transmissions amongst our migrant worker population, in particular, those who live in dormitories. Our objective is to help them to stay healthy. About three weeks ago, I had explained the whole of government resources being mobilized. And today, the interagency task force is deploying nearly 3,000 staff across various functions. I had shared the three-pronged strategy. First, to contain the spread in dormitories that already had clusters. Second, to prevent the spread in dormitories that did not yet have clusters, and thirdly, to move out and test all the essential workers across a whole range of industries. I had also explained that we needed three key enablers in order to implement these strategies effectively. We needed the forward assurance support teams, and these are the officers who look after many aspects of the workers' well-being. There are now 170 fast teams that have been deployed. The second key enabler was a robust medical support plan. We put together a holistic system with on-site facilities at the purpose-built dormitories at all of them, and this was supplemented 
by additional medical posts to look after the workers that are outside of the purpose-built dormitories. We also assembled mobile medical teams in order to provide on-site support to the dormitories that are not purpose-built, but uh, in any case, may also need special attention. The nationwide network of public health preparedness clinics and polyclinics have also been mobilised and they are helping to ensure that the workers get adequate care and support. Of course, the safe conveyance of workers in order to have their medical needs attended to is also a very important aspect. So that was the second key enabler, making sure that we have a robust medical support plan. The third key enabler was roping in the dormitory operators as well as the employers to look after things like hygiene as well as providing the necessities to their workers. So this was what we needed to do. The interagency task force has gone about its work professionally with a clear focus on the migrant workers' well-being. In the first phase, it was about getting the basics right. And what that means is we need to sort out things to do with food, to do with hygiene, to do with the safe distancing measures within the dormitories. They include making sure that the workers continue to get paid even though they may not have direct contact with their employers. And very importantly for the workers to still be able to remit money home because they still have families who depend on them. It, in this first phase, it also involved moving out more than 10,000 essential services workers, testing them so that they can continue to work safely. In addition, we made sure that the workers, whilst they are staying in the dormitories, they have Wi-Fi, they have SIM cards, and they can keep in touch with their families and with their friends. And on special occasions like the New Year, as well as the observance of Ramadan, we made special preparations for those. So we have taken care of all of these things in the first phase, all the basic necessities. In the second phase, it was about getting the medical operations right. The medical support plan was fully fleshed out, looking into the whole range of uh, matters that would make it effectively implemented, and the infrastructure as well as the medical personnel steadily built up in order to implement this plan. And if any worker was unwell, they got the same care as any Singaporean would. We made sure of that. So now I've talked about the first phase and the second phase and what you try to get right in each of those phases. We must now get ready for the third phase, where it is about getting the recovery process right. Now, this will involve housing the recovered workers in suitable accommodation. This will be necessary so that we minimize the risk of recurring transmissions. Again, this will be an enormous challenge and not just the logistics aspects of it. Many workers will be rehoused and they will have to get used to new friends. Many employers will have to adjust to their workers being in different locations with new arrangements. We will have to develop new strategies to monitor the health of the workers. This is a very important aspect of the recovery phase. How do we monitor the health conditions of the workers and take prompt action if it is necessary to do so? I should add that it's not just what happens where the workers are housed. It is also what happens at the workplace. Even at work sites or elsewhere, the arrangements will have to change and we will have to look seriously at how these workers can be kept safe if and when they are able to resume work. So the interagency task force is focused on getting its job done right. The scale and the speed of the response is unprecedented and it's critical that we get this phase done well 
so that work and business can resume safely when the conditions allow. So let us give them our full support. Um, I'd like to say something in Mandarin. Today is为了配合阻断措施，许多人也做出了个人的牺牲，包括了我们的客工社群，非常感谢大家的配合。过去三个星期，跨机构工作组的成员马不停蹄的在客工宿舍方面展开工作。以遏止冠状病毒在客工宿舍的蔓延全盘的计划保护我们的客工跨机构工作组的这项大工程是分几个阶段进行的第一个阶段是先把基本工作好我们也把大约一万名在必要服务领域工作的客工搬迁出来进行测试好让他们能够继续的工作确保必要服务能够照常的运行当然客工他们如何跟朋友还有家人保持联系还有一些回教的客工们他们在这段期间的特别需要我们也必须照顾到开始要为第三阶段做筹备的这个工作客工宿舍方面需要做调整跨机构工作组当前的焦点将继续放在客工的健康和福利上希望大家能够让他们关注于眼前的这个工作以逐步落实计划来应对客工宿舍的这个情况谢谢 Good afternoon let me add my uh, wishes to everyone for a healthy May Day, and I thank the members of the media for joining us on this uh, public holiday. Uh, we mark Labor Day this year under very different circumstances, but this is an occasion where we can once again acknowledge and appreciate the contributions of all our work workers. Uh, we particularly want to thank our frontline workers, especially those in the healthcare sector, working very hard to care for all our patients. We also acknowledge the contributions of uh, all who are in the essential workforce. For example, members of the media like yourselves, we have people doing a whole range of work, uh, whether it's cleaning, facilities management, 
running our power or um, utility water supply, ensuring our food supplies remain intact, and uh, going about providing essential services to Singaporeans. Uh, we truly appreciate all of our essential workers during this time, and in particular, we appreciate the contributions of all our migrant workers. And that's why, as you heard just now from Minister Josephine, we are mounting an all-out effort to ensure that we take care of their well-being during this period. Um, at the broader level, if you look at the situation in Singapore, this is um, one about one month since we've introduced the circuit breaker. Um, we are seeing progress on the, in terms of the outbreak in the foreign worker dormitories. The infection numbers every day still remain high, and I think they will remain high for some time as we continue to do active case finding. But the situation is under control, and we are doing everything we can to ensure the well-being of the workers and to take care of them. For the rest of the population, for the general community, our circuit breaker measures are working. We are averaging about 10 to 15 cases a day in this past recent week. Uh, so we are making progress, but we call on everyone to continue persevering with the measures that we have put in place so that we can continue to bring down the local transmission numbers and at some point in time, we will be able to work towards a gradual relaxation of some of these measures and work on resumption of activities and do so in a way that's safe and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Now I invite uh, questions from the media. Thank you, panellists. We will now begin with the question and answer segment. Members of the media, please remember to use the raise hand function if you would like to ask a question. We would appreciate it if you only ask one question to allow more to participate in the segment. We will now take the first question from Channel News Asia. Cheryl, please ask your question now. And, uh, I would like to find out more about the blocks for recovered workers. Uh, how long are you expecting to house them in these blocks and how is the space included for them? How long? How long are they going to be housed in the blocks? So, so how long are we going to house them in the blocks for recovered workers? Is that the question? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Well, the, if they are recovered workers and then these are their dormitories, then you know, they can go back to these dormitories and this might very well be the permanent arrangements for them. Right? But these are not the only solutions as we have highlighted for recovered workers. Some of them may well go back to their dormitories in these dedicated blocks where they can recover and then th this will be the arrangements for them from henceforth. But for others, we have other solutions as well and we are also, as highlighted, uh, working on new housing arrangements outside of the dormitories. Uh, in the short term, we have some arrangements including floating um, solutions, um, including... Um, um, what do you call this, cruise ships as well as sports halls. Um, but beyond that, as we've said, we are looking to build new dormitories to house some of these healthy and recovered workers. So there will be a range of solutions. Um, clearly, the floatels, the cruise ships, um, the sports halls, these will not be permanent solutions. Uh, these are interim solutions. But as we get to build new dormitories, then these plus the existing dormitories will be the more permanent solutions for the housing of workers. Thank you, Minister. We'll take the next question from today. Louisa, please ask your question. Hi, um, I wanted to ask about the new dorms that are going to be built. Um, are you guys using you know, the building of these dorms as a chance to give workers more space so they don't live in such cramped quarters so that going forward, other potential outbreaks can be managed more easily? Yes, um, there are the, the new dormitories that we are talking about, certainly um, we'll look at the living arrangements, but these are still going to be dormitory arrangements. 
right? And we are looking at different categories because um, if you look at the whole scheme of things, as I said, cruise ships, floating accommodation, sports hall, these cannot be permanent solutions. They will be interim by nature. We plan to have some quick dormitory solutions. They may not be permanent, but they give us a few years of uh, sort of a, a quick dormitories that can be built within a month. And then they can give us maybe medium-term arrangements that we can be put in place. And then separately, a work stream to build new permanent dormitories as well. And then these will be for much longer-term permanent arrangements. So there will be a range of uh, solutions that we are putting in place to house our migrant workers. But the thinking around the arrangements go well beyond dormitory and living arrangements. Because if we talk about resuming activities, for example, construction activities, and resuming them safely, then we also have to think about processes in the construction work sites. We have to think about arrangements for the workers during their off days, where they go about congregating and how to minimize such congregations. So it's in fact a whole range of protocols and measures going well beyond, beyond housing that re have to be put in place to allow for activities to be resumed safely. Thank you, Minister. We'll take the next question from Ita Tas, Afghani. Can you ask your hello. question, please? Yeah. Uh, hello. Thank you. Uh, I, have, I wanted to ask her... <clears throat> Uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design lately launched a research project about estimation at dates of COVID-19. Uh, for example, it said uh, that uh, pandemic in Singapore may end at June 28. So uh, I wanted to ask uh, what is your opinion about such project and uh, how much uh, can we rely on this uh, project? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question uh, concerning uh, projections of uh, how the epidemic outbreak will progress and eventually when they will uh, uh, end. Uh, the data that was used by the team at uh, SUTD uh, were in fact uh, very broad level, high level data and may not necessarily represent the actual way in which an outbreak progresses within a country. Uh, for example, in Singapore, as you know, we're actually seeing two different distinct phenomena occurring as far as how the outbreak is progressing. There is the outbreak that is among foreign workers in our dormitories, which has a certain trajectory. And there are also uh, uh, community cases which uh, would uh, be following a very different trajectory. And uh, the data uh, that was used in the university research project uh, aggregated all these, which may therefore not give a full uh, and uh, accurate uh, picture in terms of how the outbreak would progress in Singapore. But that said, uh, all these uh, projections are useful in, in, in terms of uh, depicting that, in fact, uh, there's still a long way to go. Uh, while different countries are at different levels of their uh, outbreak management in terms of the epidemiologic curve, uh, it's clear that for us, uh, we still need to be mindful that there may be more cases that uh, manifest themselves, particularly in the dormitory situation, and there is a need to continue to be vigilant in our monitoring, our picking up of cases, in our management of uh, patients with COVID-19 infection. We, are, we should not be complacent and assume that we are out of the woods, even if the numbers in our community remain relatively low. With each uh, case that comes, there's always that potential for deterioration, even if the uh, outbreak in the dormitories affects a predominantly younger population compared to uh, in the community there are always uh, risks that uh, some members of that community who are infected may in fact get a worse outcome, and we need to be therefore vigilant for them uh, getting complications or even passing on. Um, can I just say something to add to what um, Professor Mark has said? Um, you, I mean, there, were, there are a whole range of different models that will provide prediction and forecast depending on the assumptions, but I think it would be premature for anyone, whether in Singapore or anywhere in the world, to assume that once we pass this particular wave, 
and say in June, July, the world will be free from COVID and life will be able to resume. No one can say that. And, and experts are already worrying about a second wave of infection around the world that may well coincide with the flu season and may be even more devastating than what we have today. So the basic posture has to be that we are in for a long fight. There will well be recurring waves of infection that we have to deal with. And even if we get over this current wave in Singapore today, we have to remain vigilant and relax or adjust our measures uh, very gradually, depending on the situation, fully expecting that it only takes one case, as we have said all along, it only takes one case, one hidden case, one cryptic case to cause new clusters from forming. This can happen in Singapore, it can happen in any country. So let's not be too early to declare the end of the infection anywhere in Singapore or anywhere in the world. I think it's important for us to um, remind ourselves that even though we are seeing the number of community cases coming, coming down, we are not out of the woods yet. It is important for us to focus quite sharply on the immediate task of continuing our efforts to keep the community cases low because we do see, still see unlinked cases. With every unlinked cases, we know there will be transmission in the community that is not detected. And any of these cases, like Minister Wong said, could spark off another cluster like we have seen in the past. And these clusters can then in turn create another wave of infection. So we need to continue to be vigilant, be careful, and at the same time continue with many of our measures to keep the community transmission to as low as possible. While at the same time, we have to also uh, con concentrate on our efforts on managing the infection among the migrant workers to ensure that the numbers are managed and contained and re uh, efforts to reduce the number uh, as low as possible. So I think all these efforts have to continue. So it's too early for us to uh, uh, celebrate or to think about uh, the, uh, ending the infection in June or July or whatever time frame, but focus more importantly on our immediate tasks and to ensure that we are able to manage and contain the total number of infection in Singapore. I think that's our primary objective. Thank you, DMS and ministers. The next question comes from Brita Haryan, Nor Humaira. Can we have your question, please? Hi, I'm Humaira from BH. I understand that a lot of resources resources are being channeled to foreign workers and also infrastructure being set up to house them. I was wondering if it's possible to actually share monetary estimates overall, how much has been spent on maintaining foreign workers' well-being so far, and do we have enough to sustain this in the long run should the numbers continue to rise? Thank you. Well, we, we don't quite have the... Um, estimate of all the what what you are referring to but really i think at this stage our focus is not is is really just to make sure that we address the needs of the migrant workers as well as the needs of singaporeans so it's not one or the other we are mounting all resources to take care of everyone who needs help for the migrant worker we have a comprehensive strategy which we have laid out um whether it's their food and daily needs, as well as their medical needs, and housing for migrant workers both today and in the future, which we will have to do anyway. And for Singaporeans who are infected, uh, we also have, we have shared the strategy that we've put in place on the medical side, as well as a whole range of other plans that we have um, to address the concerns of uh, Singaporeans and residents in Singapore having to cope with the circuit breaker measures. Um, businesses and workers are finding it hard to cope. They are hurting greatly. We have put in place financial schemes to assist them. So all together, I mean, the, the resources that you see that we have put set aside in three rounds of budgets, those are the resources that we are mounting, including dipping into our past reserves in order for us to mount a comprehensive response to tackle COVID-19. Thank you, Minister. The next question comes from Business Times. Leila, can we have your question, please? Hi, thank you. 
Yeah, I'm Lila from the Business Times. My question is regarding the tightened circuit breaker measures that were announced last week, which required more businesses to close and they were told it would last until at least May 4. Why I ask what's the decision on these measures after May 4th? Thank you. Um, we, today's press conference, we are focusing on the measures for the migrant workers and what we are dealing with them. Uh, very soon, we will have, uh, I think tomorrow, we are arranging a media conference where we'll give an update, as we said we will, um, because the Titan measures we said for the, in the first instance, we'll put them in place until 4th of May, and we will continue to monitor the situation to see if any adjustments may be made then or at a later stage. So we, are put, um, we will be arranging a media conference quite soon to give an update on our position with regard to the circuit breaker measures. But on the whole, as I have said just now, uh, we are making progress. You can see that in the daily reporting of our community numbers. Uh, it is trending down, so we are making good progress, but we still cannot let our foot off the pedal. We still have to continue to work hard to make sure that uh, the measures are in place. Generally, we, we continue to stay home as much as we can, minimize contacts, and then... Um, work as hard as we can to bring the community numbers down decisively. Thank you, Minister. The next question comes from Financial Times. Stephania, can we have your question, please? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I had a question with regards to the salaries um, and uh, the sort of measures around this for migrant workers in today's uh, press release. Um, it says that about 8,500 employers who submitted declarations to the Ministry of Manpower, um, uh, basically about only 3% indicated that they owed salaries to their workers. I was wondering, is are these 8,500 employers all the employers that uh, employ migrant workers or do you only have visibility on those that submit these declarations and are these declarations mandatory or voluntary and uh, the 300 employers that still owe salaries as well as the seven employers that um, still are not able apparently to pay their workers can you ensure for certain that they will, the authorities will uh, help them to uh, pay their workers in full. Um, and very, very quickly, I just wanted to follow up on a question I had asked Professor Mack um, uh, during the last press conference with regards to the number of foreign workers in dormitories who showed uh, coronavirus symptoms and are being isolated without being tested. Uh, I had asked how many there are, um, and at the time, uh, the panel didn't have a number, and I was wondering if you did have the number uh, today, please. Thanks. Uh, to put the numbers in context, uh, in total, there are about 66,000 employers in Singapore who have work permit holders or SPAS holders. So that is the universe of employers that we are talking about that do hire work permit or SPAS holders. Not all of them have got workers who are staying in the dormitories. A good number of these employers are still able to interact with their workers on a regular basis, and that also includes making sure that uh, their salaries are paid. It is only a segment of this 66,000 whose workers are in the dormitories and the workers are affected by the movement restrictions that we have uh, required in the dormitories. That is the group of workers that we are concerned about and want to make sure that they continue to be able to receive their salaries. And the way to do so is to require the employers to pay these workers electronically. Now, um, on, uh, across the board, already we had, prior to these additional measures, 76% of the employers who paid their workers electronically. So it was really only the 24%, the minority, that we were focused on to try and help them to make electronic payment and so that through bank transfers, the workers are able to get their salaries. And then we were also working with these op uh, workers to ensure that they had access to remittance services. 
they've always had their own preferred methods of remitting monies home. But obviously, in the current situation, they may not be able to go back to their usual remittance uh, agents. So we have found different ways to help them to remit the money home. Now, as to the support for the employers to ensure that they are able to pay uh, the salaries for their workers, uh, we decided quite early on, even before the circuit breaker measures took effect, that uh, we would provide a rebate of the past levies paid uh, for uh, each migrant worker. So uh, that monies, uh, the first tranche of it, had been disbursed to the employers. Uh, in addition to that, we extended um, the rebates for, an addition, for one more month. So in total, the employers were going to get two months of um, worth of rebates for the foreign workers' levy. And we also waived the levies for two months. So this is to ensure that the employers have the resources to fulfill their obligations to their employers, to, for their workers, uh, in terms of salary and upkeep. It's not just the salaries, it's also the upkeep that, uh, that uh, uh, is important. Now, so if you then look at the numbers in context, it's a very small group, um, and uh, we are following up with them very um, promptly, and we want to understand what difficulties the employers are facing and what means we have to step in to ensure that uh, these workers' uh, salaries are properly paid. So that's uh, ongoing work and uh, we will continue to support both the employers and the workers to ensure that this aspect of uh, the, the, the needs are well taken care of. I haven't forgotten your question from the last uh, press conference. My staff are continuing to work with the interagency task force to see if we can get a good figure that is an uh, accurate representation of the number of suspect foreign workers that empirically manage for acute symptoms without testing. Uh, but they haven't got that figure to me just yet. So once I get that figure, I endeavour to try and bring that to all of you at a future press conference. Thank you, Minister and DMS. The next question comes from Ian from NTUC. Ian, you may ask your question now. Hi, panelists. Uh, Minister Teo, you earlier mentioned that during this recovery phase, right, uh, that there will be a lot of aspects that we need to look at. Um, so what I was wondering is, will, will MOM actually be coming up with any kind of new legislation about how all our foreign workers or even or even uh, office workers are supposed to proceed following this uh, circuit breaker period. Thank you. So this is a very important area of work, and we also have to flesh out the plans. Uh, the intent that we have indicated right now is that we have to start preparing for the recovering phase. And if you look at how the interagency task force has carried out its work, it's always methodically and systematically. Now, having decided that we must plan for this recovery phase, then we will have to work with many different agencies who are involved in the implementation of this plan to work out the detailed aspects. Minister Lawrence Wong had talked about earlier making sure that the new accommodations are made available and we would obviously have to ensure that the arrangements within the accommodation support our objectives, in particular the objectives of having stronger, better medical monitoring. That is one aspect of it. But it's not just the living arrangements that matter. I think another very important part of the work will be how about situation at the workplace and at the work site. So it has to be a more comprehensive approach, which is the same approach that we have taken all along when we decided to move in decisively to address the outbreak within the dormitories. So it will have to be a comprehensive plan. We will have to flesh things out. We will look at all aspects of it. At this point in time, it's a little too early to say that there will be legislative changes. We will examine the need to do so, and if it comes to that, then we will follow up accordingly. Um, can I just add, 
the point on the guidelines even beyond uh, migrant workers, just for the workforce in general. Even today, when you talk about 15% of the workforce that's still continuing to commute daily to work, we have put in place strict guidelines for the employers to ensure, for example, that safe distancing measures are in place at the workplace, that the workers wear masks when they are at work, that um, they do not socialise amongst themselves, particularly in the pantry, rest areas, when they go for lunch break, that you need to have staggered hours so that there is no congregation. Uh, these are very important guidelines and we will want to ensure that these guidelines are upheld and then expanded upon even as we uh, open up and allow more workers to continue to work. Right? So it, it ought to be in the same manner. Right? As we resume activities, it cannot be going back to the old practices, business as usual. We have to put in place new guidelines, new standards, um, literally workplace safety standards, but now safety in the broader context. You, you almost need safe distancing inspectors in every workplace, making sure that all of these standards are upheld so that workplaces can be safe when we resume ac activities. And to do all that well, uh, on top of that, we need to complement it with a regime of testing. That's why we talked about earlier how we can scale up testing regularly. And then a uh, uh, some technology enablers to allow us to ensure better tracking and monitoring should there be a confirmed case emerging in the workplace. So these are a whole series of new protocols and measures that we are already planning and we will put in place as we get nearer the end of the circuit breaker and we think about how we can allow more people to get start, uh, to go back to work on a regular basis. Can I just uh, add that um, uh, as we progressively think about some of these uh, resumption of these uh, economic activities, we, uh, Minister Wong is right that it involves not just the migrant workers but also local workers. And therefore, it is important for us to have a quite a comprehensive plan on how to resume some of these activities progressively and safely. So it's a workplace safety and health uh, approach to this uh, uh, issue. And at the same time, you also have to bear in mind that uh, the approach may be a differentiated approach depending on different sectors, different economic activities. We may adopt different measures and different precautions. Say, for example, construction sector is one of the uh, uh, area that we are very concerned about, and therefore the measures that we will put in place in construction sites will be quite different from the office workers and office environment, and uh, workplaces in the retail and so on may also be different. As many of you have seen, the uh, uh, markets and supermarkets, we have differentiated approach as well. So I think it is not a one-size-fits-all uh, uh, measure that we are going to put in place, I think it will depend on the sector and the risk assessment of each individual sectors. And we need to do it in a progressive way, in a uh, calibrated way, and also in a safe way. So more, we will share more uh, when the time comes, as, and we will progressively share more as we open up more. Thank you, Ministers. The next question comes from Vietnam News Agency, Le Tuong. Le Tuong, can we have your question, please? Thank you. Um, I, I just have one question. Um, do you have the breakdown of uh, the total of um, uh, case in foreign um, workers according to their nationalities? And uh, I am aware that most of them are, are from India, Bangladesh, and, and China, but um, just wonder how, how many of them are from Vietnam. Thank you. Uh, the number of uh, Vietnamese nationals in Singapore and certainly in the dormitories, they are a very small minority. The, the, most of the um, infected workers that you see from the dormitories, as we have explained, large clusters came from the construction sector. And, and so we have very, very few um, Vietnam, I don't even know if there are any 
in Vietnamese workers in the construction sector, but um, the we but they are even if they are, they are very small numbers. Huh? The the large larger numbers are the ones that we have highlighted, and so they are mostly not um, from Vietnam. Thank you, ministers. The next question comes from Channel Eight Frontline. Celine, can we have your question, please? Thank you. My question is, do we need to hit zero infection rate before we can relax the circuit breaker measures? If this is not the case, is there a target we are working towards? Well, uh, let me say that uh, it is uh, not easy to achieve the zero uh, cases because we are not just looking at uh, one day of zero cases, one day of low numbers. We actually need to make a holistic risk assessment, taking into account quite a number of uh, factors. Uh, we have to look at the total number of cases and total number of uh, community cases, as well as the uh, 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 relative number of uh, um, linked cases versus unlinked cases, whether they are clusters and the nature of the cluster, nature of the cases, whether they are cases that are, they have a potential to develop into big clusters or whether they are isolated and probably sporadic cases. So there are quite a, a lot of factors that we need to consider, and not just a single number uh, issue. But of course, if the numbers are high by nature, it is very difficult for us to uh, stop the circuit breaker measures. So the first priority is to bring down the number. And it's, having brought down the number, we have to look at the nature of the number, whether the nature of cases, whether the low number of cases is sustainable, and the nature of the transmission, whether we have confidence that uh, the transmission is under control. So I think we will have to take a holistic uh, approach. But it suffice to say that uh, we need to first bring down the total number of cases and particularly the unlinked cases in the community to a very low number so that we have sufficient confidence to consider whether or not we are prepared to uh, relax some of the circuit breaker measures. Thank you, Minister Gunn. The next question comes from Bloomberg. Crystal, may we have your question, please? Hi. Um, so, just to clarify, what is the percentage of foreign workers that's being tested? And secondly, earlier there was news today that um, Singapore will work with a few countries to uh, facilitate the opening of essential travel, cross border essential travel. So why those specific few countries and what is the timeline on that? And if Singapore is looking to add other countries to the list? The, the first question is, what's the percentage of foreign workers who have been tested, is it? Yes. I don't have a figure, uh, um, accurate figure to report to you. Uh, so I'll, we'll try and get uh, more information on this and, and uh, let the, the media know subsequently. So on the second question, um, this pertains to our whole controls for imported cases. Right? We have a range of controls in place today. Um, we don't allow any short-term visitors. We, for the others with passes, Singaporeans, PRs and those with passes, they come in, but then they have to serve a 14-day stay-home requirement or stay in the hotel. We now have dedicated facilities for this. So just as we talk about progressively um, relaxing our circuit breaker measures, if conditions permit, meaning to say if our community cases continue to come down and we are confident that local transmission is under control, we are prepared to lift and relax some of the circuit breaker measures. Likewise, on the import control side, when we look at the situation in other countries, and if the, the virus situation is well under control in some of these countries, then we may very well uh, work with them bilaterally or to get it together as a coalition with some of these countries to see if some travel can be done in a safe and sustainable manner. So that's the discussion that's taking place and will continue to take place. It's, of course, a very fluid situation because the situation is constantly evolving. And as we said just now, you can never assume that the fight is over because it's a continuous process and you never know 
Today, situation seems under control. Tomorrow, a new cluster may break out. So we are in this constant flux, but nevertheless, we think there is, um, just as we are constantly looking at whether or not there is a basis for us to move on our circuit breaker measures, we are likewise continuously reviewing our import controls in relation to um, various countries that may have um, put the, uh, that ha may have controlled the virus outbreak in their uh, environments. And then we will see whether the import measure, control measures uh, can be reviewed and updated uh, over time. Thank you, panelists. We now have time for the last three questions. We'll take the next question from Yahoo. Nicholas, can we have your question, please? Hi. Uh, a few days ago, we discovered that a number of malls and supermarket chain outlets are now scanning customers' uh, ICs or asking them to use the Safe Entry app. So in the light of this, uh, I wanted to ask, is the government considering making the downloading of Trace Together and Safe Entry compulsory? And if so, what is the reasoning behind this and how will the government roll this out and enforce it? So safe entry, we are already requiring for some establishments and we will want to do it in a more widespread manner. We will again um, share more in due course. That's really for establishments, not for individuals, right? So the establishments, uh, workplaces, having the safe entry requirement allows them to track the individuals who come in and out of their premises. Um, the app for contact tracing, Trace Together, we have an app that's been rolled out. Uh, we are still in the process of um, working with companies like Apple and Google to update some of the protocols so that the app can be more effective and as we do so, we will uh, share more details. Thank you, Minister Wong. The next question comes from Lian Ho Taupao Ke Yang. Can we have your question, please? Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are interested in, in, in two of the cases that was announced this day. One is um, the passing of a 58-year-old uh, patient. Uh, we were wondering because she's um, she's significantly younger than the other uh, patients that has passed on. So, um, were there any other uh, pre-existing medical conditions that, that actually contributed to her passing? And then for the cluster at IMH that was announced yesterday, could could we find out more if how how did the first uh, patient in that cluster actually got infected? Was it was he related to an outside cluster, or or was it um a no unlinked case? I'll answer the second question. Uh, I didn't quite catch the first one, so I wasn't able to. Uh... Okay. Um, actually, a 58-year-old uh, uh, category is uh, within our assessment uh, in the higher risk group. Uh, we've, in fact, looked at the cases that come from NCID, and uh, patients above the age of 50 are, in fact, having a higher risk for requiring oxygen therapy and coming into the ICU. Uh, and then as you get into the younger age bands, progressively that risk drops. Uh, within our own categorizing of uh, even uh, those who are in the foreign worker uh, uh, dormitories, uh, we are in fact trying to reach out to as many foreign workers as we can above the age of 45. We have a, that additional margin uh, where we want to uh, be preemptive about trying to look after them and try and move, remove them from uh, a higher risk setting. So a 58-year-old uh, 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 patient, uh, in fact, is in the higher ca uh, risk category. As far as the cluster of cases that have emerged in the Institute of Mental Health, or IMH, epidemiological investigation is still ongoing. So at this point in time, I'm not able to give you a lot more information about the mode of transmission, but I understand that uh, there will be some d details that will come on in the uh, press, conference, uh, press release that will come on uh, uh, either today or tomorrow, we hope to be able to give you as much more information about the, these cases. The first uh, uh, patient in this cluster uh, was tested because he developed a cough uh, after he was admitted into the ward. And this was the context in which uh, uh, he was tested. And when he was tested positive, uh, the uh, hospital immediately uh, activated its infection control measures 
uh, quickly isolating him as well as all close contacts uh, associated with, uh, with him. We will now take our last question. It will be from the Straits Times. Min Tsang, can we have your question, please? Hi, good afternoon. Uh, this is Min Tsang, Straits Times. Uh, I'd like to ask why the decision to build uh, CCS and CRS within dorms and how would they be properly ring fenced? And also, how many more foreign workers can we expect to release uh, back to work uh, up from the 10,000 essential workers currently? Your first question is on the CCF and the CRF. Mm. Your question is, uh, uh, can you clarify the question? We can't quite hear. Why, why build, why build uh, during, inside the dorms? Oh, during okay. the briefing just now, we heard um, some CRS or CCS will be built within dormitory. So uh, can we understand the thinking behind that and how will they be properly ring fenced? Yeah. Uh, one uh, reason is because uh, these workers may be returning to the dormitory. So instead of uh, discharging them from uh, CCF into a CRF uh, recovery uh, facility outside the dormitory and then subsequently put them back into the uh, dormitory, dormitory when they're fully recovered, might as well uh, uh, develop some of these facilities within the dormitory, particularly if they have come from that dormitory so that they are able to return to the dormitory and recover within the dormitory. So I think these are the considerations. There are also uh, recovery facilities that are outside the dormitory that will cater to uh, uh, patients who are not returning to the dormitory yet. So I think these are various considerations. So we are trying to optimize the resources and the capacity uh, nationwide to be the most uh, logical and rational. Uh, the second part? The second question, right? You have a, you have a second question? Ah, the how many is in, what was it? How many more foreign workers are expected to be released for work? Uh, up from the 10,000 currently. Yeah. Well, so the, the key is we have already stopped movement in and out of the dormitories. And then the only question now will be the next phase will come from the largely the recovered workers. And in time to come, um, there will be more and more workers who would have recovered from the CCF, from the CRFs. And then, I think at, at that point in time, more of, you will see more of them having recovered, and then they will progressively also resume work. Um, but for the ones who are still in the dormitories, um, I, at this stage, we are not, we are not planning to um, bring them out to resume work, right? because we are still going through monitoring, doing the active case finding across all the dormitories. So you have the essential workers who are already out, they are tested, they are working. Eventually, there will be more recovered workers and they will continue working. And then at some stage when we have completed the monitoring of the uh, cases in the dorms and uh, um, we have done the case, active case finding across some of these dorms, then indeed at that point in time, these dormitories will also be able to open up and then the workers can continue to resume work. But again, that will take some time. And so we have said earlier, the dormitory situation is likely to take more time to stabilize. Right? The numbers will still be high for a, quite a while and we have to be mentally prepared for that. But that's quite a different situation um, from the rest of the community. In the dormitories, we are dealing with it. The situation is under control, but it will take more time before we can stabilize the situation. For the rest of the population, for the general community, um, numbers are indeed coming down. Circuit Breaker is working, and we will give an update on the measures that we are going to take in the next phase quite soon. I was, I was asked just now about the 58-year-old patient who passed on. Uh, that patient also had a history of uh, diabetes. So, in fact, uh, the risk factors associated with uh, worse outcome in this case was both age as well as uh, concurrent medical conditions, in this case, diabetes. Thank you, Ministers and DMS, for your time today. 
and thank you members of the media for attending today's sessions.